Well, didn't the men do a good job today? Yeah. Um, man, good job on the audition, guys. You are all now in the choir officially, so well done. And uh, I think we'll take all of you. We'll take every one of you. So, Well, happy Mother's Day. Moms, we are so grateful that you are here today, and we want to especially say another word of of uh, just celebration of you and say welcome to Fruit Cove today on Mother's Day. If you're online listening or if you are on the radio, we are glad for you and we are thankful for you. And this morning we would like to, let's, let's just stand for a moment in honor of our moms. Can we do that and give them a round of applause this morning, please? Let's just welcome them. Let me uh, admit some obvious things up front. Men are always on the outside looking in on Mother's Day. Uh, I'm not a specialist. Every pastor I have ever known approaches Mother's Day with fear and trembling. Um, We don't want to be presumptuous about a subject of which we know little. Uh, You know, I, I had great mom examples in my life, great mom, great mother-in-law. My wife was an awesome mom. But uh, everyone's different. That may not be your story. That may not be your experience. But we also want to to tiptoe around this celebration because we want to avoid being sappy and sentimental. That's not what I want to do this morning. And I do know from an almost unanimous survey of mothers over the past 40 years of preaching that uh, the sermons that moms almost unanimously enjoy most on Mother's Day are short ones. So we're going we're gonna to try to stay with that tradition today. Um, and I also know that for some, Mother's Day is hard because your mom's no longer with you. Uh, or maybe you're estranged from her or separated by geography. Uh, for others, Mother's Day is tough because you're not a mom but you want to be. And maybe that's been a, a heart's desire for you for a long time. Um, and if that's true, we want to pray for you in just a moment. I want to show you something right now. Um, we've been praying for, I think I'm right in saying about three years for a couple in our church, Ross and Larissa Nelson, who have been ready to adopt a child receive a child uh, into their arms. And this year, baby Olivia is now in their arms and with them and sitting in the back on her first Mother's Day service. So, so who knows how God may fulfill that prayer that you have prayed so fervently. And I'm going to ask you today to do something a little bold, a little different maybe for you. And that is, I'm going to ask you if you are a woman who desires to become a mother or who desires to adopt or foster a child or whatever the case may be, um, I, I'd like for you to, if you would, raise your hand and, and hold it up for just a moment and let us, if you would, uh, pray over you. Can we do that? We've been doing that for years. Let me, let me do that right now and uh, we'll, we'll pray just that prayer this morning. Father, you see the hands, but more than that, you see the hearts of the women whose hands are raised right now. Like Hannah uh, cried out to you, Lord, uh, to look at her and, and to look on her distress not having a child. She wanted a baby. She wanted to be a mother. And that is the desire of the heart of so many in this room today. That is the the call of their heart this morning to you. Lord, I want to have a child. I want to be a mom. There's so many in here whose lives touch so many others like a mother would, but they themselves have never held a child of their own. And I pray today, Father, that you will look upon these hearts, look upon these lives, and grant the grace of granting them a child, Uh, even many children, Lord. uh, We just pray that you would move in their hearts today, that you would not 
turn your eyes away from them. But Lord, grant them that child to hold in their own arms, we pray. And if you agree with, if you agree with this prayer this morning, would you please agree with me by saying amen. Amen, amen. Well, this morning, uh, I want to read a text in Luke chapter 7, verse 11. And it says, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town. He went to a town called Nain and his disciples, and a great crowd went with him. And he drew near to the gate of the town. Behold, a man who had died was being carried out, the only son of his mother. And she was a widow. And a considerable crowd from the town was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her, and he said to her, Do not weep. And then he came up and he touched the bier, and the bearers stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized them all, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has visited his people and his report about him. And this report about him spread throughout the whole of Judea and all of the surrounding country. Now, I know this is an odd kind of text for Mother's Day. Um, I suppose the hardest thing to bear in life is the death of a child. I've never experienced that, thankfully. But no parent. Uh, no mother should have to endure the pain of outliving their offspring. And yet it happens, and it's been the experience of some who are listening to this message today. And that's the context for this story in Luke. The Bible tells us that Jesus had entered the city of Nain a few miles from Capernaum. Nain is an unremarkable location. If you've been to the Holy Land, you probably never went to Nain. It's not on most of the routes of the tours of the Holy Land. Jesus was walking with his disciples with what the Bible says was a considerable, sizable crowd who had walked along with him to see what he was going to do and to hear him teach. People would just follow him wherever he went. They never knew what he was going to do. They never knew what they were going to see. And, and what we see happening tells us three things on this Mother's Day because I want to talk specifically this morning to moms who are overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed with life. You're overwhelmed with parenting. Or, or maybe you're just overwhelmed with other circumstances in your life that make your parenting difficult, that make your mothering hard, that make it more stressful than it would be otherwise. A lot of things can overwhelm us. Uh, sometimes it's just the kids that do that. Let me, let's watch a video, just a quick video, maybe to show you that. And, and you just yelled at me to do that song when I was singing for Jesus. I'm so sorry. So that's why you should have been quiet and not yell at me. I should have been quiet while you were singing for Jesus? Yes. Okay. That was actually for Jesus. Okay. Because God sent his son to die for our sins. You are right. Okay. I'm sorry. So that's why you should be quiet. And this is our whole church. This is my future. Well, what did you do? I was... <laughs> Okay, so, have a child, they said. It'll be fun, they said. You know, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all easy. It's not a problem. It's no issues at all. But, but I know, moms, you can be overwhelmed sometimes. Maybe that's not your child. But, but I want you to know three things from this text today. Number one, I want you to know that God sees you. God sees you. Jesus Christ, the God-man, saw this woman who was not only grieving her son's death, but she was also a widow. She was left alone without anybody to support her and take care of her. 
Her son likely would have been the one to do that. Uh, Her options as a single woman in that culture, as tough as it is to be a single woman in this culture, was much more difficult in that day. And it was a, it was a very, very hard thing. It, it's hard to imagine being more overwhelmed than this woman was. But a lot of moms and parents today are facing a season of circumstances that feel like they're going to crush you. Between an ever more complicated schedule to keep up with and maybe you have a job outside the home as well, a house to take care of, can feel more overwhelming than you ever imagined possible. And maybe on top of that, you're a single mom. One expert said that in the first year of parenting, get this parents, in the first year of parenting, you have to make 1,750 difficult decisions. First year of parenting. First year out of the gate. 1,750 decisions about your child. And that's just one child. And that's just the first year. The Bible tells us about this woman. The Lord saw her. Now, saw means more than he noticed her. He saw her tears. He he saw her heart. Jesus knew what was in man's heart. He saw her predicament. He saw her fear. He saw her helplessness. Listen, he sees you today. Maybe this is your first Mother's Day without your mom. And it's hard. It's tough. He sees you. He sees your situation today. And I know sometimes you feel like you're all alone in your circumstance. Nobody notices. Nobody cares. Well, God does. Jesus shows us in this picture, first of all, that God sees us even if we feel that nobody else does. But secondly, not only does God see you, but God has compassion for you. Jesus, the Bible tells us, had compassion on this woman. You see, His mom was a widow, too. Uh, We don't know how old Jesus was when Joseph died, but he was old enough to remember watching his mother bury his father, his stepfather, Joseph. And he knew it was going to be hard on her when he left home to begin his earthly ministry, leading to his death on the cross. Jesus not only saw this woman, but he had compassion for her. Uh, from the depth of his being, okay, from the depth of his being, he felt her pain. Uh, he, 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 he felt the sting of her sorrow and loss, as many of you are feeling today. He felt her helplessness. He felt it, the, the Greek word is it, it, the, the splagnata, his, where we would be a little bit more uh, earthy with it, I guess it's guts. He felt it in his guts. In his innermost being, it, it moved him viscerally to see her situation. It, 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 it pulled something inside of him. You know, the Bible tells us we do not have a high priest who cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but who is tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus knows how we feel. He knows how we feel. Sometimes moms feel kind of alone just because nobody really gets it. And sometimes the worst person to not get it is dad, the husband. One husband wrote this letter to his wife. My darling, two nights ago, we had a huge argument. I was exhausted when I got home from work. It was 8 p.m., and all I wanted to do was lie down and watch the game. You weren't in a good mood, and you were clearly tired after having a long day. You were trying to put the baby to sleep as the other kids were fighting, and all I did was turn the volume up. Would it kill you to play a more active role in your children's upbringing, you asked, turning the television volume back down? And you could help out more around the house, too. Hey, I said defensively, I work hard all day just so you can play in the dollhouse with kids. (laughs) The argument just kept going like that. I said terrible things to you that 
I can never take back. And you screamed, saying that you were sick of it all. So you tearfully ran out of the house, leaving me to care for the children on my own. I was forced to feed the kids and put them to bed all by myself. When you didn't come back the next day, I was forced to ask my boss if I could take a day off so I could take care of the children. I experienced the crying and the tantrums. I experienced having to run around so much all day that I didn't even have a chance to take a shower. I experienced being forced to heat the milk, getting the kids dressed, and clean the kitchen all at once. I experienced being cooped up all day without speaking to an adult. I experienced the inability to sit calmly at a table to have a relaxed meal whenever I wanted because I had to run after the kids. I experienced feeling so physically and emotionally drained that I just wanted to sleep for 20 hours straight, but I had to get up a few hours after falling asleep because the baby was crying. I lived two days and two nights the way that you do, and I'm beginning to get it now. I get your exhaustion. I get that being a mother is all about sacrifice. I get that it is more tiring than being among the corporate bigwigs for 10 hours and making economic decisions. I get how frustrated you must be to have to sacrifice your job and financial freedom so that you can provide for your children. I get how uncertain you are about the fact that your economic security now depends on your partner and not just you. I get how hard it is not to be able to hang out with your friends, exercise, or get a good night's sleep. I get how challenging it is being locked up and being forced to watch the children while imagining what you must be missing in the outside world. I also get that you become upset when my mother criticizes how you choose to raise your children, our children because nobody in the world knows what is best for children like their own mother. <clears throat> Anybody else need to hear that out there? I get that being a mother means carrying society's greatest burden. Being the person that nobody appreciates, values, or remembers. I write you this letter not just to tell you that you're missed, but additionally because I don't want to go another day without telling you you are strong doing an excellent job, and I admire you. Now, that's a Mother's Day letter right there. That's a Mother's Day note right there. And that's a real thing. This was a real letter uh, posted by a guy named James White. Dads, if nothing else, let her know today that you appreciate her, that you admire her, that you respect her, because sometimes she wonders, I think. Sometimes she wonders. Well, third, finally, God can overcome the impossible. God sees what you're going through. God feels. He feels compassion for you. He feels, he, he feels deeply what you are going through. And third, he can overcome the impossible. But you know, sometimes it's not enough just to know that somebody notices and somebody cares. Every mom out here, every mom listening today has that moment when she wants to cry out, somebody help me. Rise up and call her blessed. You know what that means? That's a proverb. You know, her children rise up and call her blessed. Let me, let me make it more contemporary. Rise up off the couch and help her. Rise up. Rise up, turn the ball game off, and give her a hand. That's how you bless your mom. Not just today, say, Mom, thanks, and then you go back to routine tomorrow. Learn how to bless your mom in a real way. And so while we don't hear this woman asking for help, Jesus stopped the funeral procession. He, Jesus messed up funeral processions all the time. Uh, he stopped them midstream. They're walking, they're parading, they're weeping, they're mourning. He walks up, he stops them. Stop crying. Stop, we, don't weep. And he did something he didn't have to do. He touched, the Bible says, he touched the beer. He touched the funeral stretcher that the young man's body was on. That, that open stretcher that bore his body. Jesus touched that. He, you know, listen, Jesus sees you. Jesus has compassion for you. But Jesus also touches where you're hurting. He touched a leper that nobody else would touch. 
He didn't have to touch that person, but he did it. He sees us, he feels our sorrow and our pain, and he touches us where we hurt. And then he spoke. He commanded, he spoke to the corpse. He commanded the corpse. I say to you, young man, arise, get up, get up. And the young man got up and he started speaking. And we don't know what he said. We don't know how old he was. Maybe he sat up and said, hey, mom, what's for dinner? Well, I mean, we don't know. But, he, but the young man spoke. He woke up. And it really doesn't say he was asleep. He was dead. He woke up. He spoke. Jesus gave him back to his mother. What, what power is that? You know, we can't even wake our kids up in the morning, can we? I mean, how many times do you have to say to your child, I say to you, arise. And they just lay there, you know. Nothing happens. But Jesus' voice raised the dead. And he not only commanded the boy, but at the same time, he commanded death to release him. The Bible says that Jesus holds the key to death, to hell, and to the grave. Jesus is the one that can get you out of death and the hell and hell and the grave. He is the one that holds that key. I, I don't know. Listen. I don't know why Jesus doesn't do this for every mother who's lost a child. I, I really don't. I truly wish I could end, and, and I know there are other pastors in here today, and I know you wish the same thing, that we, you could end the funeral service just by saying, okay, I'll say to you, get up. And they get up. I wish I could have said that at my wife's funeral. Just get up. But one day, they're going to. One day, Jesus is going to say that. One day, one day they will get up. That child you had to bury, one day Jesus will say to that child, arise, and they will arise. Now, even death can't stand against the Son of God. And, but listen, this, this isn't just about parents that are grieving today. Maybe your sense of being overwhelmed today is not about that at all. Maybe you're overwhelmed because you have a child that's a prodigal. Maybe, you're, maybe they've rebelled against you. They've broken your heart. They've gone off into the far country. Maybe you have a child that's drug addicted or living a life, and you know it's not going to end well the direction they're going, but there's nothing you can do to stop them. Anybody there today? You know if they keep going in this direction, it's going to end in a bad way. And mom and dad, maybe you're just overwhelmed by not knowing what to do. A few years ago, and I asked her permission to share this story. A few years ago, I met a young lady in my counseling office who was referred to me from another church. Lovely young woman, um, bright future ahead of her. Going to be in the media, going to be a newscaster, but she fell into addiction and alcohol abuse. She'd been raised in a church. She'd made a profession of faith. She'd been baptized, but the addiction had gripped her, and, and she couldn't shake it. She lost a good job. She wrecked her car driving drunk. She couldn't give up drinking no matter what she tried. Her mom and dad prayed for her. They sat in my office many times weeping and praying over their estranged daughter. And finally, she ended up in jail for 15 months. But God didn't forget her. God did not leave her there. And while she was there in jail, she gave her life completely to the Lord. And I lost track of her there, frankly. I didn't have privileges where she was incarcerated. And I lost track of her. Never heard anything else from her until last week. And she came walking up to me between services. I, I was speechless, and, and folks, I don't get speechless very often, but I was speechless. She was smiling. She's now married. She told me she'd been coming. She and her husband had been coming to Fruit Cove for a while. 
she'd reconciled with her mom and dad. Can I be honest with you? She was one of the most hopeless cases I had ever seen. I gave up on her. I thought, there's no way. She is not going to change. She's not going to be different. I gave up on her. But God didn't. Mom, Dad, listen. Don't give up on your child. Don't stop pounding on the door of heaven asking God to remember them, to restore them. Don't give up on what God can do. He can bring your child home to you. He can restore the years the locusts have eaten. Listen, if I didn't believe in the grace of God before last Sunday morning, I would believe in it now when I saw that young woman walking up to me because I would have thought there's no way God would ever have gotten through to her. You know somebody like that? That's your child. That's your son, your daughter. No way. You think there's no way. They're not coming back. I raised them in church. I brought them to church. I did all the right things. We did everything we're supposed to do. But they still walked away. But you know, the little proverb still works. Train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. Train them up according to their way. Would you remember, as you go out today, three things? And I promised you a short sermon, so I'm stopping here. You're welcome. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> Three things. Remember, God sees you in your situation. God cares deeply about what you're going through. And God can overcome your greatest problem, whatever that is. Even the ones that you give up on. Even the ones that you said, no way, God can fix that. No way God can bring that child home. But listen, maybe, maybe you're that child today. You're, you came today because mom said, that's the only way I'm going to feed you lunch. You've got to come to church. So here you are. You don't want to be here. You don't want to be sitting here listening to a preacher or sitting with a bunch of Christian people in a building. You don't want to do that. And you got plans in your head of what you're going to do as soon as lunch is over today with mom. Let me tell you something. God brought you here today. He brought you here today to say whatever you're dealing with, he's bigger. He's greater. He can turn your situation around, even the one that you think is hopeless. I, well, there's no way I could. No, listen. You don't know God. You don't know what your God can do for you. And some of you need to hear that today. Maybe for your child, maybe for yourself. God could change hearts, and minds, and lives. He can change them. I'm going to ask you to pray with me. Father, today, again, we thank you. We thank you for every mother here. We thank you for the mothers that spoke into our lives and influenced us and sacrificed for us and gave so much that we might grow to have a decent life. And I pray for those that cannot say that today as well, Lord, they, that they did not have a mom that did that for them. In fact, it might have just been the opposite. And I pray even for them today, Lord, that you will give them the grace they need to forgive, to wash the memories out of their minds, the pain out of their hearts, because you see it. You, you see it. You saw it happen. You watched. And you can touch today the 
the broken heart, Lord. I pray that if there are those here today who are like the young lady I shared about, that they would begin a step toward you today, that they would take a step that would make a difference in their lives. I pray that they would come to you humbly, repenting, saying, I believe that this Jesus who raised a dead boy at a funeral can bring life to me. Because you see, friend, the Bible tells you that you are dead in trespasses and sins until Jesus resurrects you. You can't fix yourself. You can't make yourself good enough. But you can come to him today by faith and give your life to him. So come now and do that. Father, have your way in every heart, every family, every home, every life, we pray in Jesus' name. Let's stand together.